Well, good morning, CCC. Good to see all of you this morning. My name is Joe. It's good to be with you this morning. Let's help my eyes out and move that up a little. Hey, we're in a brand new teaching series called Devoted. It's an exciting series that's asking a basic question. And that question is, what kind of things were the early, de- early followers of Jesus devoted to? What mattered most to them? And by learning the answers to that question, we might be able to discern some things that ought to matter to us today. Now, where can we find that information? You know, it's not like we can go into a time machine and you know, go back and, and just observe these guys for a while. We can know, though, because God, who happens to have unmatched wisdom and discernment, has recorded for us in the Bible the story of those early followers of Jesus. It's written down in a place called the Book of the Acts of the Apostles, which we often shorten to the Book of Acts. The idea behind this, friends, is that you can often go back and tell something about the nature of a thing by looking at the source, by looking at its beginning. I'm a country music fan. Don't hate me, okay? Uh, Any other country music fans out there? We got a couple? All right. Hey, this service is... I love you guys so much more than that early service, man. (laughs) Those guys, they're merciless. Um, I recently spent about six or seven nights watching the Ken Burns documentary on country music. Anybody else watch that with me? Okay, we got more hands again. Um, It was really well done. Uh, Great, great series on, on the history of country music. But can I tell you a secret? It's not a spoiler if you haven't seen it yet. But when trying to explain country music, when trying to define it by, and, and in trying to help people understand it, Ken Burns did not start with the story of Jason Aldean. <laughs> he didn't start with Dirks Bentley or Tim McGraw even. He went a little further back than that. He went all the way back to some music from the Appalachia area. He went to the music from the South and to music from African-American gospel, which all kind of fused together in the beginnings of the parts of the beginning of the last century to develop country music and lay the groundwork for what you might hear on the radio today. Interesting to see the beginning and how it led to what is. I think every so often it's good for the church to ask the question, What was it like at the beginning? What was it like at the beginning, the founding of the church? Have our values changed? Have we gotten away from anything that made us strong through the centuries? Even more importantly, have we gotten away from anything that has identified us as a distinct people of God? It's important questions. So before we dive in this morning, let's kind of pray and invite God into our study time. Lord, uh, thank you for this opportunity to be together to study your word. We ask that you would help us to discern those things to which we should be most devoted that can help us to walk closely with you. Guide us today and be with me, God, as I speak. I pray in Jesus' name. You know, after Jesus' resurrection, he had ascended into heaven, and he told his apostles to wait. He instructed them to wait for the outpouring of God's Holy Spirit that was going to empower them for the task that was at hand, namely the starting of the church. And after a period of waiting and a period of prayer, God released his spirit on the disciples in a powerful way. The Bible says it was like a mighty rushing wind that came in and shook the place where they were. And God's power came over the apostles of Jesus and they began to share boldly in public places, namely the temple courts, about who Jesus was. On the very first day that this happened, the very first proclamation of the gospel, over 3,000 people said, we want in. We want in. We want to follow this man named Jesus. And they gave themselves over to some things. Uh, They devoted themselves to some things that were going to help them to walk closely 
with this Jesus who was their new Savior. Now, this word devoted has a straightforward definition. Devoted means to endure steadfastly, to be loyal, to give oneself over to something. Notice this passage from Acts chapter 2 about these early disciples then. And they devoted themselves. There's that word. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And what I want you to notice here through our study this morning is what happened to these believers, to these Jesus followers. There, there's a descriptive phrase used by John Ortberg when he describes these early followers of Jesus. He describes them as being radically committed to God and deeply devoted to each other. Radically committed to God, deeply devoted to each other. Isn't that a great description? Something to aspire toward. This Jesus thing was not a passing hobby for them. It was the real deal. They were all in. You know, back in 1991, I got my ham radio license. It's really kind of a long story, but I felt that I would be able to communicate with missionaries that were in these really kind of far off and remote places. And at the time, I had a good friend who'd gone to Ecuador, and, and he was kind of in this situation. I thought, well, this would be really cool to, to learn how to communicate this way. So I learned Morse code, and I studied all of the materials that, that were there, and I passed my test, and I became a licensed amateur radio operator. But my interest kind of quickly faded, particularly when this thing called the Internet came along like a year later, right? <laughs> and all of a sudden, the way people communicated got really different, and the world kind of shrunk, and my interest in amateur radio just sort of went over. Well... When it says that these Jesus followers were devoted, that's a continual observance of these things. This wasn't a passing fancy. This wasn't a hobby. If you're devoted to a person or a workout regimen or a code of ethics, it means you're not easily going to walk away from those things. Now, Acts 2.42 lists four things that these early followers of Jesus were devoted to. First, they had an unwavering devotion to the truth. Acts 2 says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Now, the apostles had just spent three years at the feet of their rabbi Jesus. They walked where he walked. They slept where he slept. They listened to his preaching. They carried his message of truth. You might remember this, but just before his crucifixion, Jesus prayed over his disciples. This prayer is recorded in the book of John chapter 17. And when he prayed over them, he asked for something specific for the apostles. Notice this. He says, Father, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Now, that's a prayer from Jesus over the apostles. That word sanctify simply means to be set aside for a specific purpose. Jesus prays for the apostles. He says, Father, let them be set aside by the truth and for the truth, dedicated to it. And the early church dedicated themselves to living out that truth that the apostles taught. Now, how did they hear the apostles' teaching? I mean, as far as I can tell, there weren't any podcasts in those days. They didn't have a TV ministry. They didn't have a radio ministry. Well, one way people heard the apostles' teaching is that the apostles traveled. They traveled all over the place, all over the first century world. In fact, the book of Acts is a little bit like a travelogue. It records the movement of many of the apostles. We went here and we did this. We preached in this place. And then we went to this city and we talked to these people. And, and so you can just follow through if you read from beginning to end the book of Acts, the way that the apostles were traveling around the known world, speaking the truth of Jesus, the truth of salvation. Another way that people heard the apostles' teaching was through the Bible. You know, most of the New Testament is the apostles' teaching, directed in the form of letters to churches, letters to regions that were distributed among people so that they could read what this teaching was. And they were instructions on how to live, how to connect with God, how to interact with the world around us. And those words were full of life and grace and truth because they came from Jesus. They came from the Holy Spirit of God. Now, friends, 
it's probably never been more important than it is today to have some kind of compass to navigate through our society, through our culture. There are so many voices that claim to have a right way of thinking or a right way of living. How do you know who to listen to? How do you discern? Where's the truth in the midst of it all? You ever stay up late and watch TV late at night? I have to admit that, that I do. My sleep patterns aren't always the best. You know, at a certain point in the middle of the night, you really only have two choices on television. Sports Center and infomercials. Because that's what it boils down to. Okay, at a certain point in the evening, that's all. And I am amazed that even though I don't cook, I mean, my idea of a homemade meal is like a really good grilled cheese or something, right? So even though I have no culinary skill, I am so tempted to buy the magic bullet. <laughs> it's like I've got my phone in hand, I'm ready to dial the number. Or those green, better than Teflon pans. You look at those, you think, wow, you can cook anything on those. They're just, they're awesome. They're wonderful. Those commercials are persuasive. I need a food dehydrator. <laughs> I'd use it all the time. I'm sure I'd use it all the time. And dehydrate banana chips and stuff, right, to keep for later because I eat so many of them. <laughs> I need to buy Payo videos because who doesn't want a Pilates and a yoga workout kind of put together. And I especially want those special ops sunglasses. <laughs> Guys, has anybody bought those? I just want to know. Does anybody have the special ops sunglasses? You're all too ashamed to say that you've bought them. Somebody, <laughs> somebody in this crowd has bought special ops sunglasses, and I want you to find me afterwards. I want you to tell me if they're really as good as, as what they say on the infomercial, because I'm almost there. I'm telling you, I'm like a fish on the hook. When those things come on, you know, I mean, they've got me. Well, here's the thing. If you haven't learned yet, man, lots of people today, they just promote their own self-interest. Modern philosophies come at us like infomercials. They really do. And what happens is, just like on the TV commercials, people raise the decibel level. They speed up the cadence of their voice. They make it seem really exciting to try to convince you of something. And, and I'm not saying that everybody's trying to deceive you today, but I will say that a lot of people are flawed in their thinking. And we have to be careful and guard ourselves so that we don't base our lives on whatever the, the latest convincing talker was that we listened to. Remember, just before Jesus went to heaven, he told the apostles, go into all the world, make disciples. You baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then he said, you teach them to observe everything I've commanded you. This is the apostles' teaching. All those words from Jesus, and those words are full of grace and truth and life. Friends, this devotion to learning the truth is so essential to our, our disciplines as Jesus followers. I spent the last four years of my life being a part of a Bible translation ministry because we believe that God's word transforms people's lives. And so we've been working really hard to get the Bible into every language possible. And it's a big task, folks. There's, there's more than 1,500 languages left that don't have any portion of Scripture. The Bible changes people. And this biblical truth, this is an essential part of the things that we do here at this church. We take teaching time every Sunday to look at the truth in the Bible. It gives us perspective. It teaches us to have strong character. It helps us to understand God and what it means to live in relationship with Him. It teaches us about ourselves, about Jesus, about living in love in this world. And when we're devoted to learning the truth in the Bible... It can change the trajectory of our lives. We, we won't be the same people. But Acts 2.42 also mentions that this early church had a deep devotion to each other. Not only did they have a devotion to the truth, it says they were devoted to the apostles' teaching and also to the fellowship. Now, if you're like me, that word fellowship feels really spongy, doesn't it? I mean, what exactly is fellowship? Is it friendship? 
I mean, it seems to be. Is it camaraderie? Is it more than that? When I was a kid, you know, I grew up going to church. I grew up going to a small church. And, and that word fellowship, whenever I heard it growing up in the church, it always seemed to surround food or coffee. So we had fellowship dinners where people would come together and everybody would bring a dish, right? And everybody would share the dishes and, and uh, all the good ones were gone right away and you know how it goes. We also had fellowship hour after the church where the parents would go and they'd drink a cup of coffee and the kids would run around like wild maniacs. Um, the other kids, not me. Uh, I don't get that picture from Scripture that that is what fellowship is. I, I think we've taken a cobra of a word and we've defanged it. So now it just means people enjoying each other's company in an air-conditioned foyer. Being devoted to the fellowship means more. Fellowship certainly has something to do with Christian people getting together, but it's more than just being together. It's being together for a purpose, for a reason. We're together to help each other become better followers of Jesus. We're together to serve people. We're together for a purpose, to advance the influence of the kingdom of God. Now, when we do that, some really powerful relationships form. And in that sense, it's not unlike men and women who join together and serve in the armed, armed forces together. You know, when somebody signs up to, to serve in the Army or Navy or one of, one of the branches of the military, they don't sign up because they're just looking for a place to hang out with people, right? They sign up to advance the causes of the country. But in the midst of advancing the causes of the country in that intense service together, some really strong bonds are formed. It's not unlike athletes who come together on a team. They have a goal. When athletes come together on a team, they have a goal. The goal is not friendship. The goal is to develop a winning team. The goal is to develop a championship team. Now, often when you hear athletes interviewed after they've achieved a great championship, you'll hear them say things like, we really came together like a family. These people are like relatives to me. The intensity of their relationship formed around the mission, around what they were doing. One church leader remarked about it this way, it is good to spend time together as a congregation in all kinds of ways. However, simply being together, getting to know each other better, finding a few more friends, that is not the goal. The goal is growing in faithfulness to the mission of Christ in this world. We gather to encourage each other in our faith and life for Christ. We help each other to be better Christians on our jobs, homes, neighborhoods, schools, in our travels, our retirement, our relationships, our service work, whatever we do. In other words, we devote ourselves to grow in faithfulness to, minister, to the mission of Christ, to bear witness to the kingdom of God in all the areas of our lives. Now, here's the cool thing, right? As we develop these deep relationships because of this thing called fellowship, there's a deep love that begins to flow among God's people. Now, that love's not meant to just stay in-house, but the in-house love that develops as we are on mission together serves as an example to the world of the kind of God that we know and love and serve. Jesus once said to his disciples, by this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. That love happens as we join with each other on purpose. So I'd suggest this. When you come together as a church, when you come together in subgroups of the church, when there are events that are happening, remember to build into each other. Remember that there's a purpose in your gathering. Let's make sure our conversations go beyond, how's work going? Did you buy that new car? How's your mom? There's a place for those questions, certainly. But remember that fellowship is gathering in order to advance the kingdom. And the relationship is the byproduct of that. If the relationship becomes the only goal, we never get the mission accomplished. 
We're just kind of another civic group. So advancing the kingdom, that can be a simple mission as encouraging each other in the way that we follow Jesus. I'm going to give you a good spiritually driven question that will advance the kingdom in your Christian friends, okay? And it'll get beyond the, the veneer level of communication in life where, where we often tend to live. When you gather together with, with other folks that are part of the church, maybe just ask them this. Hey, what, what's God teaching you these days? What's God up to in your life? And we go deeper and we get on mission together. Let's move on. The early church also had a deep devotion to regular spiritual recalibration. Acts 2 says they were devoted to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, and the breaking of bread. And it seems really evident from, from the, the context of all of this, when Luke mentions the breaking of bread, what he's really talking about here is something we just participated in, the act of communion. And from the earliest days of the church, this weekly celebration has been a part of church liturgy. I want you to see how the Corinthian church kind of put this into to play from their very beginnings. In the book of 1 Corinthians, the apostle Paul writes this, these words, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it. Notice the breaking of bread. He said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Jesus had instituted at the Passover this meal of remembrance. Unleavened bread to symbolize his sinless life. Wine or grape juice to represent his sacrifice. And churches throughout the years have celebrated this act in what's commonly called in many denominations as the Eucharist, which simply implies thanksgiving, that there's a thanksgiving that takes place in this act. Now, let me ask you something. Why? Why devote to that? Why devote to the act of communion, aside from the fact that Jesus told us to do it? Well, I have an opinion, and I'll ask it in the form of a question. How many things do you do in your daily life that you feel are actually propelling you closer to God? And how many things do you do in your daily life that seem to help you drift farther away from Him? And we live in this world that has, you know, a, a lot of sin, a lot of things that, that kind of get in the way of, of our relationship with God. And it feels like much of what we do can cause us to go into drift especially, I think, in, in a culture that seems to want to compartmentalize God at best and is sometimes hostile about God at worst. Today, there doesn't seem like there's very much room for God with us, for this concept of Emmanuel. We, we use that concept of, this, of, of Emmanuel, meaning God with us, a few Sundays around Christmas, right? We relegate it to that. But when we celebrate the breaking of bread, it's like a spiritual recalibration. We remember in those moments that we're sinful. And when we take communion, it reminds me, I need a Savior. I can't do it on my own. And Jesus forgives. And He's already forgiven me. We have a weekly engagement to experience the thanksgiving of communion. And as we remember that reality who we are and who Jesus is, it changes everything. Folks, if we don't practice this together, we go into drift. So just like these early followers of Jesus, we devote ourselves to a regular celebration of communion, a regular remembering, a weekly recalibration that there is a Savior and I can stop my striving to try to earn something that's already been freely given to me. Regular remembrance at communion makes a grateful church. 
and a grateful people. There's one more of these core values that the early church showed a devotion to. It was a devotion to humility. And in this instance, I've used this idea of humility and prayer interchangeably because prayer is humility. It acknowledges that there's a God and you're not Him, okay? It's a declaration of dependence on the one who is greater than all of us and who's greater than all of our troubles. Now, this is so important. Why were the early followers of Jesus so devoted to prayer? Well, they had a tremendous task in front of them, didn't they? They had no cultural advantages. They weren't rich and powerful people. In fact, the church seemed to attract the disenfranchised of society, the disadvantaged. Add to that that they were teaching unpopular teachings in a society that was committed to different values. So how in the world was the early church going to have any kind of impact? Well, they prayed. They prayed and they petitioned God to release His power to them. And they prayed that they would be faithful to follow. They prayed for boldness. They prayed for courage. And in their prayers, they showed deep humility, a reliance on God. Now, friends, they were devoted to the truth. They were devoted to each other. They were devoted to this regular spiritual recalibration called communion. And they were devoted to the humility of depending on God. And I want to say very clearly that those are still values of the church. We still gather regularly to hear the apostles' teaching. It shows us how to live. We still value the relational piece of what it means to be in the church. As we move together on mission, our friendships are often transformational. Communion is still honored by the church. Deep reflection is encouraged. And we hold up prayer as that conduit through which God's power is released on this earth. And I believe that this church has to remain committed. We have to be devoted to these things just as much as those early followers of Jesus. And what happened as a result of that for them? Well, the world's never been the same. Notice how Luke summarizes the results of this kind of devotion by those early Jesus followers. Acts chapter 2, verse 43, the next verse. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received food with glad and generous hearts, praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Those are pretty significant consequences pretty significant results of this devotion. So let's just notice a few of those before we wrap up. Notice the results of being devoted. Number one, they had an awareness of God's presence. Day by day, these followers of Jesus could see that God was up to something. He was up to something in their midst. It says here that everyone was filled with awe. How does that happen? It's when you begin to see God at work around you, and you don't just gloss by it. Now, I know things were a little bit different then because the apostles seem to have some special gifts from the Holy Spirit that we don't all share today, but God was doing some pretty awesome stuff through everybody to get the church established. And notice it says here in Acts 2 that the people were filled with awe over what was happening. They could see God at work. That tends to happen when you pray bold prayers and you begin to see the results of those bold prayers. You look at life with a sense of expectancy. You're looking for God to be at work in your life. Now, God was not their genie. They weren't rubbing the lamp and making wishes, right? But they were praying bold prayers for the sake of the advancement of the kingdom of God. And they were joining Him in the midst of that. I just want to ask you, when is the last time that you were in awe of God? When's the last time that you were actively looking for Him in your circumstances? God, what are you up to? I wonder, what kinds of things can we pray about as a church that when they happen, we'll be in awe because God showed up? 
What kind of things can we pray to happen in our lives where we can stand in awe of God? Because he still works. He's still at work. The early church was a culture that saw what was happening around them. They saw God's fingerprints on things. I want you to notice another result was a tremendous spirit of generosity. It says all the believers are together. They had everything in common. They sold property when they needed to. They distributed it when they needed to. Now, I don't want to spend a lot of time here because churches and pastors get beat up on talking about money and giving, but I'll simply put it this way. Christian people, followers of Jesus, ought to be the most generous people on the planet. We just should. Because God's a generous God. And Jesus gave everything. We ought to be generous with our time. We ought to be generous with our expertise in helping other people. We ought to be generous in church in the way that we serve. We ought to be generous with our money. Folks, we ought to be the best tippers at restaurants. Waiters and waitresses should be fighting over the Sunday afternoon shift at work because they're ready for the Christians to come and eat, right? Because we ought to be generous. When the people in the church have a need, we ought to rally to that need. And when people around us in life have a need, we ought to be asking ourselves, is this a chance for me to model the generosity of God right here with this person, whatever it is? Well, notice also the church was filled with a sense of joy. Luke says they joined together with glad and sincere hearts. You know, there were no plastic faces Nobody was feeling like they needed to pretend. People weren't faking it. There was a realness about their disposition of joy. Not because everything was going well in their life. If you read through the book of Acts, there's some trouble going on. But they were glad and sincere hearts because of who God was and what he was doing within them. Folks, I believe with all my might that the church should be a place of joy in your life. There's no extra spiritual points for looking somber right? God doesn't say, blessed are the curmudgeonly. <laughs> and I think Christians are, ought to be, man, we ought, we ought to be the most attractive people in the world because we're filled with joy. All right, last byproduct of this radical devotion, the enjoyment of God's favor. The church experienced the enjoyment of God's favor. The Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Folks, Think about this. When Jesus died, his followers huddled in an upper room. It was safe, it was secluded, and they all could love each other. But then Jesus gave them a task after the resurrection. He said, you will be my witnesses. And they couldn't do that from the upper room. They couldn't be his witnesses and stay secluded anymore. They had to actually be involved with people who needed to hear the gospel. They had to live out the gospel in front of other people. So they took to the streets and they met in the temple courts because lots of people were there who needed to know Jesus. They were driven. I'm always reminded that the church is the only institution on the face of the earth that exists primarily for those yet to be a part of it. We're to be out there and living incarnationally the truth and the love of Jesus. Friends, when I look at the early days of the church in the book of Acts, what I see is that Jesus, through his disciples, was building a whole different kind of culture, a counterculture, an upside-down culture, where people loved and shared and gave things away in a world where people hoard stuff up. I see a place where disenfranchised people in that day, women and children, were valued and encouraged. I see a place where people treated each other differently than what they were seeing in the rest of their culture. They treated each other as they wanted to be treated. No wonder the church exploded in the early days after Jesus' resurrection. Who wouldn't want to be a part of a group of people who put other people first and who brought out the best in you? And that's the culture that Jesus initiated in the church. What kind of culture are we building here? Imagine for a moment what it would look like if we devoted ourselves to the apostles' teaching, to the truth, 
What if we devoted ourselves to the fellowship, to the weekly recalibration of our souls, and to prayer? I, I think when I imagine that, I can imagine a culture of love and grace and truth where people are radically committed to God and deeply devoted to each other. Let's, let's make that a reality. Would you pray with me? Father, when we think about being devoted, we don't want to just be devoted to a set of things that make us busy. We don't want to be devoted to a set of activities that don't have any kind of outcome. Lord, what we really want to be devoted, we want to be devoted to being followers of Jesus and doing the kinds of things that bring about abundant life in us and in those that we know and those that we yet are yet to have met. We want to be devoted to the right things. So give us courage to make those kinds of choices, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.